It's great to be back. I get the opportunity to be with you on the stage once a year because of Bernie creating space for women and empowering them. And so I honor you, Bernie. Thank you for championing people. And today I feel it's significant. I usually share about Carrie Jed Montgomery, who's one of my heroes. And about a couple weeks ago, there was something going on in my heart and I changed what I was gonna release today because I feel like it's gonna be a word for you today and right now in this season. <laughs> and I feel the weight of it. I feel the weight of it. I feel like many of us are pregnant with dreams and promises and destinies. And that today for some of you will be a day of birthing. Today will for some of you, will be a day of gathering your midwives and finding your midwives so that when it is time to birth and release, you're prepared and you're ready. I don't know if we can get the PowerPoint up, but that would be great if we could. Um, I, I, I feel like today will be a defining moment for you guys. What's being released today is actually um, some of the research I did with Bill. The book's not going to be out until January 1st of next year. So what you guys are getting right now is um, you're pioneering. You're getting something ahead of time. So whatever you want to do with that, you guys get a little treat, a little insight story. Um, spring up a well. This is... Um, a picture of a key, that's my hand, I wrote Spring Up Oh Well. That's, that's the key to Evan Roberts' house in Wales when I got to go on a trip there. And I believe that there's a key in what's going to be released today for your destiny as individuals and also as a community. Because what if, what if BSSM is just an excuse for God to congregate this community? and prepare you. What if this is the community God wants to bring the next Jesus people movement through? The next Welsh revival, the greater thing. What if we're all here because God has positioned us and aligned us for such a time as this to actually lead and break the next generation into the promised land? And so a lot of things happen, Jess, you can start head heading up. A lot of things happen when I release this, and I'm really excited. This is Jessica Tate. Come on, Jess. Jess is a powerful woman of God. So I'm going to have her share um, what happened when uh, she heard the same thing released just to prepare your heart. So. Wow. Uh, I'm up here to stir up expectation, but it's already so full in the room. I don't even know where to start. Um, many of you know I came out here, I'd done missions to Congo, just, you know, preached, done all sorts of stuff. And, you know, I would say I was really, really hungry, you know, really loved the Lord. And I, you, one of those things, like, God, increase my capacity, but I don't, I don't know how much more you can stretch me. Anybody ever been there? So how many of you have done Jim's class, Defining Moments? Come on, a little shout. If you got rock, just give a little shout. If you did Jim's class, that would be awesome. And the last one from Papa Martin, it just got better and better. I got to be part of several terms. It just got better and better. But my very first term, I was here. I was a student in the very first class, and she was teaching on this, the Welsh Revival. And as she was speaking on a man by the name of Reese House, I just began to feel the presence of God come into the room so thick that I literally slid out of my chair, was on the floor, the face first, not having a clue what was going on around me. I tell Jen, I'm sorry, I lost track of what you were saying because I was being so rocked by God. So can I, I think she would say, it's okay, give yourself permission. If you start getting wrecked while she's talking, that's okay, right? That's okay, okay? So I'm on the ground, and he just begins to rock me, and I'm weeping, and I don't know why I'm weeping, and I'm shaking, and I don't know why I'm shaking, and I go home, my roommates are on the back row back there, and I said, look, something is different. I don't know what it is, but a hunger has birthed inside of me like I've never felt before. And some of you guys right here are like, look, I've been in BSSM for eight months now, I know what hungry is, there's more. There's more. I, I was like, I've been on the mission field. I've done this. I've done that. There's more. There's more. There's a deeper hunger. And as she shares about the Welsh revival, it birthed out of a place of such intense 
hunger that their entire lives were changed. How many of you would like to walk out of today saying something was birthed inside of me today that made me so hungry that my entire life changed and I will never, ever, ever be the same? So I'm going to pass this off to Jim, but I just want to say right now, just put your hands in the air, and I just say, God, rock us today. Rock us like a hurricane. Release such a hunger that we will never be the same. Birth inside of us a passion that brings in a billion soul harvest that changes the globe. Hey, open up your spirits right now, because why not now? introduction for you. Um, I also have another testimony. Because the Welsh Revival, three, there's three components of it. I actually want to take you guys on a journey today so you can actually experience some of what God did 100 years ago. It was testimony, prayer, and worship. And so we're going to have all of those elements. I released this in Hawaii at a YWAM school, in Counter School. And as I'm releasing some of the testimonies I'm about to release to you today, my translator, she translated in Korean. She gets overwhelmed with the Holy Spirit. She can't translate anymore. People come and hug her and say, you can do it, I know you can do it, I know you can translate. And she's like, I know I can. She was overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit. And so I just put my hand and I said, more Lord. She drops to her knees. She's like, can I use the microphone? Can I say a prayer? And I'm the one she's supposed to be translating for. And I'm like, sure. Hand her the mic, she gets on her knees, confesses, and says, God, I'm sorry for losing my first love. I'm sorry, it's all about you. I've been doing ministry, but it's all about you. It's all about you. And the presence of God crashed in. People got reconciled. People were on their faces from what's about to be released. It was a defining moment for that community. It was a defining moment for Jessica. It was a defining moment for many people. It has marked me. And so I'm just saying that so that you guys compare your hearts. I feel like there's some of you, as, we're, as I'm sharing, are going to start to physically feel fire on your body. What God is going to do when you feel that, He's actually refining you. He's actually burning away things. He's purifying you. So you will begin to feel fire. Some of you will begin to feel fire. The other thing I felt like the Lord's going to do today too, and it might be through the process, is He's going to fill the whole civic with the water of the Holy Spirit. So by the end of the session, you will be upside down. Your, priority, your priorities, priorities will be turned upside down. And you'll be totally flooded with the Holy Spirit in a greater measure. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We invite more of your presence. We say, if you don't show up in a greater measure, what's the point? We don't want to do school. I don't want to speak. I don't want to recover revival history just to remember. Lord, I want to go deeper and further in you. And so God, I pray right now that you would overshadow us. I declare Haggai to you that the glory would be greater than we've ever seen in this world. God, would you let your fire come? God, would you position us for the next wave of revival that's coming? This tsunami wave of revival that's greater than the Jesus people movement, that's greater than the Welsh revival. God, would you position us? Would you bring everything into alignment? One of the girls that listened to this testimony in Hawaii was out in the spirit for an hour and a half, and this is what she says. Literally, I was taken over by the presence of the Holy Spirit. My whole body was numb and I couldn't move. I've never experienced God like that. I was conscious, but at the same time, I wasn't, and I was in another place. I felt so weightless, like I was lying in a cloud. It was the craziest sensation I've ever experienced. I saw myself as a little girl running and dancing with Jesus. I feel like God was telling me to return to childlike faith. 
and that he was also doing heavenly brain surgery on me and rewiring my brain to think more heavenly and get rid of doubtful and passive thinking. He was just telling me to focus on his presence so that he could take me deeper. And so as I take you on this journey with the Welsh Revival, if you feel um, you want to come up to the front, if you want to kneel, if you want to lay, if you want to receive, however you need to respond, this is just wide open for you to respond however you want. The Holy Spirit's going to come. And that the heartbeat, the next slide please, the heartbeat of the Welsh Revival, it was revival centered on cultivating God's presence. A nation was changed because of worship and cultivating God's presence. People would come from other nations to Wales for one purpose. They didn't come to see an awesome worship band. They didn't come to hear an incredible anointed speaker. They came to meet with God. That was their one purpose. They set everything aside to meet with God. This is an eyewitness. This is what she said. She was at a, a meeting at the Welsh Revival, and she said, I saw a large, deep gallery surrounding the chapel packed with men. There were many intensely earnest faces, not looking around or talking to one another, but with one consent, they were utterly taken up with God. The body of the chapel was so crowded with men and women of all classes, but with one purpose, to meet God. There was no opening to the meeting, our hearts were full and burst with prayer and praise to a God who felt to be in our midst. Hmm. Evan Roberts, 25, 26-year-old, when he actually led the revival, God cannot do a great work through you without doing a great work in you first. I say BSSM qualifies as God doing a great work in us as he's preparing to do a great work through us. So Evan Roberts had a series of encounters. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, had a series of encounters around the same time. There was a revival that started breaking out in this place in Wales called Nuki. And the way that the revival actually started was before Evan Roberts. There was a meeting going on of people seeking more of the Holy Spirit. And this girl named Flory Evans, got up, she was just a teenager, and in the middle of the meeting, with a tremor in her voice, she said, I love Jesus Christ with all my heart. And when she said that in the meeting, it was a catalytic fire, and that was what started the Welsh revival. This group traveled and released impartation, just like many of us will travel and release impartation of what God is doing here. Evan Roberts, around the same time, he's in that room. I got to visit that room. That is the room for three months. He was overcome in the presence of God. From one in the morning till five in the morning, he was encountering God and taken up to heaven and, and just intimacy with God, connection with God for three months. And then he'd go back to bed. Around nine o'clock, he'd wake, wake up again and encounter God until around noon. So for three months, he was encountering God in this season. His family's like, what's going on? He's like, I couldn't even explain it. It was too divine. I was getting marked by God. And so this is happening. God's preparing him. He prayed for revival over 10 years. He prayed for the fullness of the Holy Spirit ten, over 10 years. He went to church services and prayer meetings almost every day of the week for many, many years. Some of us have been contending and birthing things for many years. Heidi Baker got called to Africa, England, and Asia as a teenager. It wasn't until 20 years later she first stepped foot into the land of her destiny in Mozambique. Evan was praying over 10 years to see this revival. So I feel like some of us have been praying for years and years and years and have yet to see the fulfillment of the promise. But I just want to encourage you Sometimes things that make huge impacts take time to form. God has not forgotten you. The nation of Mozambique has been radically transformed because Heidi didn't give up. The nation of Wales was radically transformed because Evan Roberts did not give up. And so he goes off to school 
around this time that revival is starting to be birthed in Wales. And he encounters some people that have experienced the fire of God that he's longing for. So he goes to a meeting, and I'm going to read his defining moment to you. And this is what I read at the YWAM base in Hawaii when that girl got slain in the spirit and the other translator called out. This is, this is Evan Roberts' defining moment. He's 26 years old now, and he's encountering this new outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And this is what he says. On Wednesday, I went to Blandenurch. In the morning, I met the railway guard at the shop and told him that I was like Flint. I was as if someone had swept me clean of every feeling, and my conviction was that I must either be cast on a bed of affliction or receive the Spirit mightily. I must either be sick and die, or I need more of the Holy Spirit. I can't go on. Most of the major turning points in revivalist lives have been, I'm not going to eat until you meet me. Amy Simple McPherson, I'm not eating until I get baptized by the Holy Spirit and I have more of you. Catherine Coleman, I need more of you or I'm going to die. And then the next day, he saw the young women from Nuki, and they tried to encourage him. Is there anything we can do for you? And he said, no, I have only to wait for the fire. I have built the altar and laid the wood in order and have prepared the offering. I have only to wait for the fire. The fire is coming. And it's good. It's painful. And it's hard. But God promises that we will walk through the fire. Isaiah says that. Not avoid it, but we will walk through it. About half past nine the next morning, the fire fell, and it has been burning ever since. We started for Bland Nurch about six o'clock Thursday morning. Now joyful, now sad, now hard, now cold. So my feelings varied on the journey that morning. Fellow revivalists, when your emotions are extreme, it's usually because you're on the verge of one of your biggest breakthroughs. You're not going crazy. That's part of the makeup of a revivalist. It means you're on the verge of something great. At the close of the next meeting, Reverend Seth Joshua prayed and said, during this prayer, do this and do that, bend us. He did not say, oh Lord, bend us, but it was the spirit that put that emphasis on me for bend us. This is what you need, said the spirit. And as I went out, I prayed, oh Lord, bend me. Do whatever you want with me. I am yours. On the way to the 9 o'clock meeting, Reverend Seth Joshua remarked, we are going to have a wonderful meeting today. And to this I replied, I feel myself almost bursting. The meeting having been open was handed over to the Holy Spirit. I was conscious that I would have to pray. And as one and the other prayed, I put the question to the Spirit, shall I pray now? And he said, wait a while. When others prayed, I felt a living force come into my bosom. I held my breath and my legs shivered. And after every prayer, I asked, shall I now? The living force grew and grew, and I was almost bursting. And instantly, someone ended his prayer, my bosom boiling. I would have burst if I had not prayed. And what boiled me was the verse, God commending his love. I fell on my knees with my arms over the seat in front of me and with tears and perspiration flowed freely. I thought blood was gushing forth. For about two minutes I was fearful and I cried, bend me, bend me, bend us. What bent me was God commending his love and I not seen anything in it to commend. After I was bent, a wave of peace came over me and the audience sang, I hear thy welcome voice. And as they sang, I thought of the bending on judgment day and I was filled with compassion for those who would be bent on that day and I wept. Immediately following, he had a burning passion for souls. He had boldness to preach. He read the word and ministered. Less than a month later, on October 29, 1904, he saw a vision. Him and his friends saw the same vision of a hand stretched out from the moon. 
And from that, he believed souls were going to be saved. And so he prayed for 100,000 people to know Jesus. October 30th, 1904, he went to a meeting. He got caught up in a vision. His body shook, and he saw a vision of people in his hometown desperate and calling out for more of God. He wasn't exactly sure what it was, and he, told, he wrote a letter and said, I could not con concentrate my thoughts on the work of service that I prayed. My thoughts were wandering, and my mind riveted on our young folk at Moriah. There seemed a voice as if it said, you must go. And so then he, he had this vision to go home, and he wasn't sure. He went to his minister and said, is this from the Lord or is this from the devil? He didn't know if it was God calling him or if it was Satan and the enemy. And sometimes we don't know the difference. God's about to bring us into one of the biggest breakthroughs of our life, and we don't know if it's God, if it's our own mind, if it's the enemy. When I was about to step into Destiny House, I had no money, no car, no place to live. I used, I, I had the, the limited resources I had would have covered money for the first month's rent and deposit, and that was it. And I'm at the Wells Fargo downtown three years ago. I'm in the car with my friend, and I'm trembling, and I'm like, am I making the biggest mistake of my life? because I knew it was either the biggest mistake or the biggest breakthrough. I rented the place, one floor by myself at that point in time. Three years later, we have all three floors that we're renting, 16 people. Countless people have been blessed and changed from that one decision. But I didn't know if it was the biggest mistake or the biggest breakthrough, and I was scared, and I felt like I was jumping off a cliff, and I needed to either have God give me wings to fly or him to catch me, and he did. And so Evan, he feels compelled. So rather than wait and pray, there's times it's important to wait and pray. The very next day, he responded immediately to the leading of the Holy Spirit. He got on the train, went back home. He was only going to be there for a week. That same night, October 31st, 1904, there's redemption in Halloween, guys. It's a special day. It's a day of Reformation. Martin Luther pinned the theses. It's also the day that the Welsh Revival was catalytic. There's redemption to celebrate and pull in. We can go to the next slide. So he goes there. Thank you. Um, on October, th oh, sorry, go back, Mariah Chapel. Um, goes there. And the little one on the left is where he preached. 17 people were there. He convinced them all to confess Christ. They got saved. He knew that was the beginning spark of what would later be the revival he'd been praying his whole life for. That week he had meetings every night. By the end of the week, 65 people got saved. Um, meetings eventually would go on from 7 o'clock at night until 4.30 in the morning without any break. We can go to the next slide. Cities were transformed. There was city transformation. Um, less than four months later, over 84,000 people got saved. Can you believe that? <laughs> donkeys. People got so transformed. The donkeys and the mining workhorses, they didn't know how to respond when the miners, rather than cuss and kick at them, they actually were gentle and nice. So no work got done. At stadiums, can you imagine a football stadium? Worship songs breaking out spontaneously. People forgiving debts, people um, paying off debts, reconciliation. It was city transformation. It all came from a place of cultivating God's presence and worship. The meetings were, the meetings, uh, the heart of the meeting was cultivating God's presence. It was a spontaneous flow of the Holy Spirit. It was worship, it was prayer, and it was testimony. That was the heartbeat of this revival. And I feel like we're on the verge <laughs> of another great awakening, another great revival. And that's part of the reason I felt to shift this talk to Evan Roberts, to what can we learn from him. Evan did not finish well, unfortunately. Part of it um, was because of his pattern of isolation. He was a revivalist that was catalytic for a revival, but he had a pattern in his life where he did not dive into community, but he isolated himself. 
And that's what we need to know is we need community. We need to strategize, surround ourselves with community so that we can birth and bring the revival God wants to do in and through our lives. I feel like the glory that's coming, that tsunami tidal wave that's been prophesied is so great. The, the glory is going to crush us if we are not in line and position exactly where God wants us at the right time. Evan said yes immediately and went and was catalytic. He could have said no. So there's moments, I know a lot of us are praying about summer, where are we going to go next? Position yourself. What do you burn for? If you burn for the Congo, maybe God's positioned you here to find other people that burn for that. Maybe you'll live together. Maybe you'll be strategic and pray together so that when you go, you can take a nation from what happens here in Reading. go to the next slide. What we're going to do right now is this is a prayer that Evan Roberts would send on ahead of him. He would have the children pray this prayer so by the time he got there, revival was already breaking out. And then after that, a song that was birthed from revival history that I believe is a song for our generation is going to be released by Elisa and then Katarina is going to come as well. And I want to declare that today will be a defining moment for some of you. That you'll be marked Total consecration, total surrender comes from knowing God, knowing the one thing. It doesn't come from let me surrender, let me give everything. That comes from a place of encountering God. And so if we know Romans 8, 32, if God didn't even spare his own son, how could he not give us all things? Once we know that, we're undone for life. We're undone for life. And so I want to call you guys today to total consecration to total like surrender, to total alignment. Like when you're pregnant, you cannot eat junk food. You cannot drink wine. You have to focus. And I feel like what if our generation is in a place where we are focusing because we are about to push through? And what if what if the, the jar that's about to be poured out just needs a few more prayers and then this revival is going to come and sweep us all away? What if? What if, but we need to focus. I feel like now is the time of focusing. Now is the time of gathering your midwives. Now is the time of preparing. We have at Destiny House, we have someone that's very pregnant, about to have a baby this week or next week. When this baby comes, our whole community is going to get together and do worship in the house so that the baby is birthed in the presence and glory of God. The same is for revival. We have to be ready. If we're not ready, we can miss it. And the glory that's coming is so big, it will crush us. So I urge you and I call you guys to be sanctified, to be set apart, to be consecrated, to, to let anything that, that is in your way disappear. Like, don't... This is what Evan Roberts said. This is the plan he gave every single night um, at his meetings. He says, this is what the Spirit revealed to me. We must confess before God every sin in our past life that has not been confessed. We must remove anything that is doubtful. 
even the good things, total surrender. We must say and do all the Spirit tells us, and we may make a public confession to Christ. And so um, right now, we're going to read this prayer. I don't know if you can see it, but we're just going to declare this over us. This is the prayer that he sent aside. And when, when this happens, I believe God's going to rush in even, even greater power. So on the count of three, however you want to position yourself, we're going to ask for the Holy Spirit to crash in. So send the Spirit now for Jesus Christ's sake is the first one. So on the count of three. One, two, three. Send the Spirit now for Jesus Christ's sake. Send the Spirit now powerfully for Jesus Christ's sake. Send the Spirit now more powerfully for Jesus Christ's sake. Send the Spirit now still more powerfully for Jesus Christ's sake. Bye. 